All right, composite beams. Chapter I, it's not just for steel beams, it's gonna be also for columns and other sections like beside the W section. But in here, I'm more interested in W sections when you have a concrete beam supporting it. And as you see here, the spacing from a beam to a beam is gonna be equal to B. So from central beam to central beam is gonna be equal also to B. So if you like, consider a slab width, which is gonna be the flange, the compression flange in this case, is gonna be also equals to B. So this B here, as if I cut this piece here from that location to that location, just take it out, start to do my analysis. Now I need to have a good connection between the concrete to the steel beam. I may have this studs. This give you the center studs that you look at. You can have one row of studs, like just one in the middle, or you can have two. It depends on your design and the amount of studs that you need between the steel to the concrete. Also, you can have a small channel that's gonna be welded to the steel beam and it's gonna be buried inside the concrete. So it's gonna be more than one way that you do this mechanical connectors, if you like. In industry, we call it the stud. Uh, in the code, you're gonna see it called out as mechanical connectors. And this is um, um, a picture of the composite beam that you guys have seen before in previous slides. And as you see here, the metal deck, it is gonna be like corrugated, it's gonna be going up and down, and it looks like this. And then you're gonna put it there, and it's gonna be supported on beams. And in this case, you just come back and then pour the concrete within this metal deck. Now, in this case, you don't really need to have any formwork. Why? Because this metal deck is gonna be working as a formwork for the concrete deck that you're gonna be placing there. Now, I'm gonna go back here one slide. Now, look at the beam configuration. Now, I'm looking here and thinking about the metal deck direction. What direction should I put it at? Can I say here, if I have all the beams, it's gonna be running this way, it's gonna be a girder, metal deck is gonna be running this direction, which means the flute or the reps, this is gonna be the flute or the rep, is gonna be running in this direction. So if you cut a section through this, right, through this beam, this is what you're gonna be seeing. It's gonna be this. Let me confirm this again. If the metal deck is gonna be running in this direction, which means all the reps is gonna be moving this way, now you cut a section through the beam, right? This section is gonna be parallel to the flutes, which means you're gonna be looking at this because this is now is gonna be the steel beam supporting the metal deck and then after that, the concrete. But if you cut a section through this girder, now the metal deck is gonna be running right and left and this is exactly what they're gonna be looking at. So this section here is cut through the girder and this section is cutting through the beam. Now, how about this guy here? What would you call this? You gotta say, this is gonna be the beam, not the girder. So if you cut the section, it's gonna be in the beam itself. Look from this side, you see just a couple of lines here, like three, four lines, right? Three lines. Metal deck is gonna be from here to there and then concrete topping is gonna be above it, like in here. You have two lines for the metal deck and then the concrete is gonna be right there. So this section here, if you are cutting through a girder running this way and then you cut look that way. While in this section here, you're just looking at the beam from this location. All right. Now, where do you find at this kind of metal deck? You have suppliers and fabricators for the metal deck. For example, you have this Verco catalog. This Verco catalog, you can download it for free. You have one, um, I'm gonna say manual, and this manual is gonna be for uh, roof decks, and another manual is gonna be for floor decks, just because there's some differences in the way that they apply it. Floor deck, it means the one that you have uh, like just roofing in the top. Uh, the uh, floor deck is gonna be the one that you fill in with concrete most likely. This system here we call W2 or BLW2 and this one is PLW3. And also it's famous, if you like to call this one, you just call it W3 or W2. You don't really call it PLW3, you just call it W3 deck. So this W3 deck, the standard sections looks like this. You see the distance from 
flute to a flute, the top of it is gonna be 12 inches. Also, the distance from here to here, from the bottom to a bottom, is gonna be also 12 inches. Same thing for the W2. W2 means that the depth of it for the metal deck only is gonna be two inches. So now the concrete topping is gonna be right here above this. Same thing here, W3 means that this gonna be W3. And it comes different thicknesses. Let me take you here back one slide. It means that the distance from here to there is gonna be either two inches or three inches. It's gonna like the typical decks that you're gonna find out there in the market. And then right above it, which means the concrete topping here, it can be two inch, three and quarter, three and a half, four inch, four and a half. It depends on what exactly that you'd like to use there. Also, one thing here that you need to notice that the distance from a stud to a stud is gonna be now 12 inches. Reasons because if you look at the distance from here to there, it's gonna be also 12 inches. Any questions? Sir, can you repeat the last statement? <laughs> what I'm saying is, if you look here, the distance from the peak to a peak, like the top loot, top of this loot, top of this loot is gonna be 12 inches. So is it gonna be 12 inches for all decks or for two and three inch decks? For most decks, it's gonna be the same. Usually it's 12 inches for most decks. So everything that I have seen in my life, it is usually 12 inches. Unless someone's gonna produce new catalog, and then all of a sudden you see a distance which is different from 12 inches. Okay. But most likely it's gonna be 12 inches. This means okay. that the distance here from this point, the low point, to another low point is gonna be 12 inches. This is the reason if you like to put this as Nelson stud, usually you put it at 12 inches. So I guess say the minimum is gonna be 12 inches. You don't wanna skip one and put it at 24. And you have either that you're gonna put one stud or you put two studs like in this picture. So most likely people would like to put just one stud at 12 inch throughout the length of the beam. Now, how about the other beam running in this direction? Like in this guy here. You can play with the spacing the way you want it. So if you like to put it at six inches, you should be able to. But here you cannot put it at six inch for this beam. So this beam is support the metal deck and the deck is gonna meet with it only at 12 inch or something. But in here, the deck have this continuous contact with the steel beam. So you can put as many Nelson studs as you want, if this makes sense to you guys. Professor, so the cell decks, like um, it acts as a four mark as it says in the picture and the concrete is just poured on top of it and it's just yes. uh, stays there. Yeah, so first you put the steel beams, you put all the framing, you put the middle deck, and then you weld the studs to it. Then you put the reinforcing bars. This gives you a very light mesh. And then after that, you put the concrete. So in this case, you don't really need to shore uh, the steel deck. And this is what okay. will be your target. Because if you want to shore it, it's going to be more expense. It's going to be taking time. OK, thank uh, you. Sir, a steel deck is used to join the um, concrete to the uh, stud, or uh, is the stud used to join? And the deck to the concrete. Okay, the studs is gonna be welded to the steel beam. So when they start well from the top, they're gonna cut and burn the metal deck. So that at the end, the stud is gonna be welded to the steel beam, not to the metal deck. So when you're welding mm -hmm. this stud through the metal deck, you're gonna cut it, you're gonna create a hole. So and basically the... A uh, steel beam is used to join the deck to the concrete, right? Yes, the stud is going to be connecting the concrete to the steel beam. And the metal deck is not going to be loose. This is not going to be a big hole around the stud. Actually, the welding material is going to be combining the stud to the metal deck to the steel beam. Okay, thank you. No problem. What you see here is more information about the metal duct. I just got it because I'm not really interested in it now. But just so you know, this gave me the thickness of the metal duct. And this is given here in gauge. So for example, you call this 22 gauge, 20 gauge. So when it comes to sheet metal or metal duct, the thickness usually is measured by gauge. It's not gonna be by, um, by inches. Just to have an idea about the meaning of this gauge thing. 
Um, here is the thickness in inches, the design value and the minimum value, which means that there is some tolerance that you should be able to see. And as you see here, the very common metal deck that you're gonna be using is gonna be 20 gauge. And here's the thickness for it. It's gonna be roughly 0 0.03, let's say three or three, four, something like this. Something is gonna be in this range. In melts, it's gonna be 33. This is what you call here, 33 melts. So let's look at this. I'm thinking here, which one now is thicker? Is it the 20 gauge or the 16 gauge? Look at this. 16 gauge is gonna be heavier. So when the gauge number is smaller, it means the thickness is gonna be larger. And the reason because this gauge means that you're gonna be taking one inch and cut it into pieces. So when you have more pieces, the deck itself is gonna be thinner. When you have less pieces or less fractions, you're gonna have thicker metal deck. So if you like to specify a metal deck, you call it by deck, by gauge. You don't really call it by an inch. You cannot really call it by an inch. Here is the way that you weld a Nelson stud or shear stud to the steel beam. As you see here, here's the weld. The weld is giving the perimeter. So during this welding process, and this welding process is gonna be through electrode, they're gonna be burning the metal deck and then attach finally the Nelson stud to the steel beam flange. If you like to do this, you got to be careful about the exact location of the stud where you put it, because you need to have it contained in certain amount of concrete. As you see here, if you have W3, the amount of concrete confining or containing or surrounding the Nelson stud is gonna be four and a half inch. If you go to W2, it's gonna be three inch. There's another metal deck called B4 block and you, are, you need to have at least two and four three inch. You would like to have this in the middle as much as you can. I mean, the stud to be in the middle of the beam. Sometimes it's gonna be a little bit shifted, which is gonna be okay. Let me show you here in plan. The minimum spacing, and this can be happening only if you have the metal deck parallel to the steel beam, like what you have here in this section. See here, this is gonna be like a solid piece and it's gonna be parallel to the steel beam and the minimum spacing is gonna be four and a half inch. You don't go lower than this. And the maximum is gonna be 12 inches. So whether you have this continuity of the concrete above the steel beam, you're gonna see here the maximum space is gonna be 12 inches. In some cases, you may have like two rows of studs is gonna be above the steel beam. And you like to hear, you don't want them to be touching each other. So you're gonna have your three inch minimum, if this makes sense to you guys. Also you have minimum distance from the edge of the steel flange to the face of the stud of seven, and seven eighths of an inch minimum. So if you like to put two rows, you need to be careful because you have a three inch and then the stud itself is gonna be either three quarter of an inch or seven eighth of an inch. So in this case, the minimum width for a steel beam flange to be used with two rows is gonna be five and a half inch. Something that you need to be careful about. You don't wanna put them in trouble in construction and you put a steel beam with something lower than five and a half inch. All right. Some cases you have an edge condition, sometimes you have it parallel, and you see what happened? You try to keep here the steel beam. It's like to have here the stud to be right in the middle of the steel beam as much as you can. In many cases, it's gonna be off by half an inch, which is gonna be acceptable. Now, in this case here, you have a, a solid piece of concrete, it's gonna be parallel to the steel beam. And here you have it also paired to the steel beam, but this gave you like an edge condition, if you like. Here is the actual information that once you open the catalog or the manual for this, you're going to see it. It says here W3 formula. This gave you the W3, which means the metal deck W3. Depth of the metal deck from here to there is going to be equal to three inches. Now, the amount of concrete popping above it is going to be a different story. So let's say that you put two inches above the W3. Now we have a total thickness of five inches. So actually this page here, it shows the five inch thick is gonna be total thread depth. Now let's see what is the information available from this supplier. It says here, if you're gonna be doing normal weight concrete, now it's gonna be some challenge here to figure out the volume of the concrete because the thickness is non-uniform. 
you don't really have it as five inch and you don't really have it as three plus two. You don't have it all completely produced concrete. Because of the thing here, they give you here calculation for the weight of the concrete. And the weight of the concrete is gonna be 42.3 PSF. This weight here does not include the weight of the metal deck itself. Are we good? So this weight, the 42.3 PSF, is gonna be the weight of the concrete, including this piece that goes up and down, but does not include the weight of the metal deck. So the question is, how can I find out the weight of the metal deck? They give it to you right here. They say, if you have 22 gauge, 21 gauge or 20 gauge, this gonna be the weight of the metal deck, galvanized metal deck. 20 is gonna be 2.3, here is 2.1 pound per square foot, and this gonna be 1.9 pound per square foot. The number which is in italics is gonna be Newton per meter square. We don't use this. So again, the weight, let's say I'm using here, W3 was two inch above it, which means total of five inch thick, Normal weight concrete, the normal weight concrete, that one when the unit weight is 145. The concrete weight only is gonna be 42.3. And then you add, if you have 20 gauges metal deck, it's gonna be 2.3 plus 42.3. So you end up with 44.6 pound per square foot. So again, this weight here does not include the weight of the metal deck. You can pick it up from here. And the reason that they did it this way so from here, you just have the weight of the concrete and then you pick the metal deck that's gonna go with it. They give you here some properties for the metal deck itself and how much it can support and this kind of things. I'm not gonna be interested in this. I'm more interested in the steel beam design. All right? But most likely are gonna be using 20 gauge. All right? This moment of inertia provided here for you which is, let's say for 20 gauges, gonna be 0.896. This is gonna be the moment of inertia of the metal deck only. Concrete here is not included. This here is the section modulus in inch cubed for the positive moment and negative moment. The reason that they give you here these numbers is so that you know how much this metal deck is able to support. So it is not really about the beam design. This is gonna be all for the metal deck design itself. Because the question is, why should I pick 20 versus 22? 22 is gonna be much thinner. Usually in construction, the standard is used a minimum of 20. You don't wanna go 22 if you're gonna put there some concrete. So most likely use 20 or maybe use 18. This is gonna be the very common, I'm gonna say metal deck gauges that you're gonna be using. I moved here to the following slide. As you see here, I have total of five and a half inch. This gave you also with W3, which means you're gonna have three inch plus two and a half inch of concrete above it. Look what happened here to the weight, 48.3. Can I go back here one slide, one step. So in here I have 42.3 when it was only five inches. Now in this slide, it's gonna be 48.3 for the uniform weight of the concrete. This is gonna be included in the total five and a half inch, excluding all of these voids that you have in there. Now also you need to add the metal deck weight, which is a 2.3. It's gonna be added to the 48.3. Okay. Also we have W3 when you have four and a half inch concrete above it. The only reason that you're gonna have this combination is because if you are looking for two R fire rating between two occupancies, let's say, Below this level, you're gonna have an office space, uh, excuse me, above it, you're gonna have an office space, and below it, you're gonna have, let's say, park construction. So you have different type of occupancy. So if you'd like to provide here two hour fire rating, this is gonna be the best combination that you can use. So this co composite action here, or this composite section, is approved for two hour fire rating, and you need to go with seven and a half inch total slab depth. In this case, you have here three inch, plus four and a half inch above it is gonna be full of concrete. Look at the weight, it went up a lot. It's gonna be 72.5, and this does not include the metal deck weight. Metal deck weight, you can take it from here. So if someone is doing here the load criteria, which means trying to figure out the weight applied to the steel beam when he's doing framing design. You need to figure out what metal deck that you're gonna be using, let's say 20 gauge, the weight is gonna be 2.3, 
plus the concrete topping and let's say it's gonna be seven and a half inch normal with concrete you're gonna be taking 2.3 plus 72.5 now we have the weight of the metal deck and concrete topping you may have some other dead load like for example um plumbing light fixtures uh, conduits pipes uh, air conditioned ducts that you need to add all of this weight to this composition also if you are doing a beam design you need to add also the weight of the steel beam itself and this is what you call here the dead load so dead load is going to be the weight of the concrete metal deck and all the steel framing and some miscellaneous the miscellaneous weight is going to be let's say like light fixtures again and like um like um, mechanical ducts and so forth so we looked at this w3 plus uh, four and a half inch above it total of seven and a half we also have this w3 and five inch but here's a big change now it becomes lightweight concrete why do we need to have lightweight concrete i'd like to hear from you guys in some uh, while constructing some places they need lightweight for example if you're making the columns too thin you don't want to place a heavy weight slab on top of it you might want to place a lightweight slab or in really high rise buildings you can't uh, use heavy slabs and the lower sections because they are already taking load from the upper section so you usually use a lightweight slab why why do you need lightweight concrete I understand that in high rise buildings or other structures, um, lightweight is preferred, but what is the reason for this? Because its weight is lighter than as compared to no normal concrete weight. That's why we call it lightweight and that's why we use it. Yes, I understand that when you use lightweight concrete, the weight is going to be lighter. This is what you're saying, correct? Yes. But what is the benefit of having a lighter weight building? Uh, it could be a cost thing so you could have uh, smaller beams beam sizes to support the lightweight concrete this is correct and what else reducing dead load for seismic inertia exactly so this is gonna be the main issue you'd like to reduce a seismic weight seismic weight is gonna be the big issue here because the lateral system including moment frames and brace frames they're gonna be supporting all of this weight so changing here the weight of the concrete let's say from look at this unit weight Unit weight here for the concrete, normal weight concrete is 145. Normal weight concrete here or light weight concrete compared to this 110, 145 to 110. Big change. There's a big drop here. And this is gonna be reducing or affecting your design in the steel moment frames or brace frames. Look at the difference in weight here. For the five inch, you have 32.1, just for the concrete weight. And of course, the metal deck is gonna stay the same. Now let's look here for five inch with normal weight. 32, if you remember, that was 42. So I have reduction here of nearly 25%. You have like quarter of the weight we just saved by switching from normal weight to light weight. Now, which one is more expensive when it comes to the concrete itself? Do you think it's gonna be the normal weight or the light weight? Um, light weight concrete is expensive as compared to normal weight concrete. This is true. Yeah, because the aggregate itself is kind of expensive. It is not that easy to find. So actually, it's going to be more expensive to do lightweight. But the overall saving in lightweight concrete is going to be higher. So this is why it is preferred. Now let's move forward here and look at six and quarter. And someone's going to be saying six and quarter exactly. I'm going to say yes, because this composition here is tested for fire rating. This is why you're not gonna be going here to six inch, it's gonna be six and quarter. Three and quarter inch plus W3. And with that, you're gonna get this fire rating. And of course, the weight also is given to you. So the weight is right here. Don't forget, beside this weight, you need to add the metal deck weight. Now, how do you weld the metal studs or the Nelson studs here to the steel section? It's gonna be done by this electrode. If you see here, there's something like a gun, and this gave you like, um, so uh, let me show you this nice video that you'd enjoy watching it. Did, did you guys hear this music? Yes. Let me put it there. Yes, we did.
get our Sir, we can't uh, hear anything. It's played a critical role. You guys see the picture? Is the clip clear to you? Sir, the picture was clear, but we couldn't hear anything. The volume, it was not working. You might have to leave your mic on. Uh, you For over 75 man? years, in helping leading companies stay ahead of the curve, one split second at a time. Nelson's split-second stud welding process is based on the same metallurgical principles as any other arc welding procedure. An electric arc is used to melt the end of the stud or electrode and a portion of the base metal. The Nelson stud welding system consists of a digital power control unit to supply DC weld current, a lightweight welding gun or tool, and the required accessories to accommodate a wide variety of metal weld studs to satisfy any fastening requirement. The stud welding process starts with a stud and ceramic ferrule inserted into the stud welding gun. The stud end is then placed against the work and the trigger is squeezed. An electric arc between the stud and the work creates a pool of molten metal which is confined by the ferrule. The stud is automatically plunged home. The result is a high quality fusion weld providing a consistent positive attachment in a split second. Because of the molecular density brought on by the intense heat within the weld, the weld itself is stronger than the stud every time. So as you see here, the welding process doesn't really take any time. It's very fast. And you see what he's doing here. Not all Nelson's. Once he's doing it, actually he is welding the stud not this stud, we're talking about the other stud, but here is the process. And it doesn't take any time. I agree. This is often used in applications such as signage or insulation installation. The stud welding process was originally invented by Nelson prior to the U.S. entering World War II as a solution to the time-consuming problem of securing wooden decking to the flight decks of aircraft carriers. The common practice then was to drill holes through the steel deck and hand weld bolts from underneath. Ted Nelson's time-saving idea allowed topside welding through holes counterboard in the decking. Nelson's first systems had the added advantage of being lightweight and easy to move in cramped quarters. There were no concerns about what might be above decks, behind bulkheads, or about leakage problems. Because unlike drilling and through bolting, stud welding takes place entirely from one side. From this beginning, Nelson's stud welding has expanded dramatically within the ship industry and in thousands of applications in every major industry throughout the world. The construction industry was fast to adapt and expand the scope of the Nelson stud welding technique. And by the mid 50s, the applications for stud welding in the construction industry had become virtually limitless. Thousands of buildings and bridges were built safer and stronger with lighter and less steel through the use of Nelson shear connector studs, which bond concrete to steel in order to develop a composite unit. Nelson's systems also proved uniquely effective at other major functions, including securing electrical and mechanical systems, fascia, concrete forming, timber shoring, curtain wall, and concrete connection. One example of the era was the Manhattan Bridge in New York, where 1,700,000 studs were welded to the bridge surface. Studs are also welded to bridges on which the concrete is worn away between the grids to leave their metal exposed and slippery. Proven safe and cost-effective, 
for over 75 years. Today, Nelson Stud Welding is the acknowledged leader and an integral part of 21st century construction and manufacturing techniques in many industries. Contractors are frequently called upon to place metal deck upon beams with stud shear connectors welded through the deck to the beam and on top of the deck to provide a permanent form for the concrete. Minimizing shoring and eliminating virtually all operator error and the cost of forms. Nelson studs can be welded to virtually all metals. Resultant benefits are speed, economy and strength. Compared to hand welding studs, such as deformed bar anchors, shear studs, and concrete anchors, the semi-automatic process of stud welding provides consistently better weld quality in regards to physical strength and controlled chemical properties. In the 1960s and 70s, the automotive and industrial industries were seeking more economical manufacturing alternatives they naturally turned to Nelson for individualized solutions for stud welding. Nelson responded by creating specialized systems for enhanced manufacturing of vital components and automatic feed handgun systems with rates up to 60 studs per minute and stud diameters up to one half inch. Typical robotic welding of T-studs was adapted by a Chrysler assembly plant where Nelson dual schedule transformer rectifier stud welding systems weld trim studs to secure window molding. T-studs welded with robotic installations provided more reliable location and stud positioning characteristics than was obtainable with handguns and movable fixtures. As computerization and robotics technology advanced, Nelson incorporated state-of-the-art developments into increasingly advanced automotive and industrial equipment and systems. The development of more advanced robotics and weld stud systems also led to more extensive use of threaded studs for functional attachments on underbodies, floor pans, firewalls, interiors, and engine compartments. Nelson Systems robotic installations are also being used to weld fir tree studs. Nelson weld cells are Nelson specialists from the largest and most experienced sales force in the industry consult the job site or in the shop in setting up the equipment. And uh, about the use of Nelson studs, how it works and how fast it can be done. And as you see here, while you're welding it to, through the metal deck, it just cuts the metal deck and goes to the steel beam itself. All right. Professor, so the studs, they just go through the flange and they just keep sticking out, as we saw in the video? Yeah, once you, once you, start, once you start here to take this stud and start to weld it, it's going to be cutting through the metal deck because the metal deck is not that thick. So it's going to be only, as you see here, the thickness, is only 20 gauge. It's like 0.03 of an inch. It's gonna be very small. So you're gonna burn it, and then this stud here is gonna be get connected to the steel beam directly, the flange of it, if this makes sense. Yes, okay, thank you. Very good, thank you. So what I'm gonna be interested in, in this chapter I, is give you the rolled or build up section build up section or rolled section, I'm gonna be working here with the W section. This gonna be the only section that I need to cover in this course or in this few lectures. So it's gonna be the W section with some concrete topping. This is actually copy and paste from the AIC 360-16. So I'm gonna be looking here and see that it says here that there is two methods if you like to do this analysis for composite sections. First method is called plastic stress distribution the second one is called strain compatibility method. This method here means elastic. So actually, to summarize it, we have elastic and plastic distribution, if you like to use it, and determining the strength of the steel beam with the concrete topping above it. So in the strain compatibility here, what you need to do is to draw the strain distribution and do the stress distribution, and then you say this section, composite section, is going to fail when the concrete compressive strain is going to be reaching 0.03. Very similar to the concrete, but it's going to be about here, the 
elastic stress distribution. The other method here, you say, in the tension side and compression side over the steel only, the steel stress is going to be equal to the yield strength. The entire section, not linear distribution, no elastic distribution. And for the concrete, it's going to be reaching 0.85 FRMC. And this reminds you here, I'm sure, with the concrete design, same way that we do concrete design. So now let's go here a little bit in depth in both methods and see how it is used. And when do you think I'm going to be able to use the plastic or the elastic? And which one do you think is going to give you higher trends? If you apply the principle of the plastic stress distribution, if you apply the principle of this method, you're going to get higher capacity for the same section. If you apply this principle, you're going to get lower trends. So I guess everybody is going to say, I'd like to use this because for the same beam, I can have higher trends and I can support more loads. But here's the catch. You need to check something about the compactness of each one of this section first. So let's say that you have more than one steel section. You can check the compactness using doing this check. You take here the edge, which is the total depth of the beam, divided by the whip thickness. Look at this, H divided by TW. What's TW? The whip thickness. And this gives you the total height of the steel section. And then you check. If it is lower than 3.76 square root of E divided by F sub Y, this gives you ES, the 29,000, divided 29,000 KSI, divided by 50 KSI. You do this check here. If the section is compact enough, you can do the plastic stress distribution. If not, you need to do the elastic stress distribution. Now let's go here a little bit more in depth and see what is the reason that you're going to be allowed to use it. If you satisfy this condition, and then if not, you need to do the elastic. Let's look here, here's the section. Let's say plastic neutral axis give you right here at this location with the neutral axis. Here is the strain distribution. It's gonna be like this, just linear relationship. Elastic stress means that you're gonna have just a straight line. In the top here, the strain in the concrete is gonna be 0.03. At the bottom is gonna be whatever is gonna be based on this neutral axis location. So in the elastic stress, you're gonna have big compression force is giving the top, big tension force here, and then the moment is gonna be equal to C or T multiplied by the distance from the tension to the compression. Now look what happened here. In the top here, the concrete is gonna be exposed to 0.85 F prime C. This is gonna be for the concrete. The steel in compression, the stress here is gonna be equal to F sub Y, the yield strength. Also the steel in tension is gonna be also equal to F sub Y. So in a case like this, you are taking the section and then you start to squeeze it. And then you start to add more stresses here in this location. So in this location right here at this plastic neutral axis, if you're gonna go here right just one inch below this location, which means right here. In this distribution, the stress is gonna be very low. In this distribution here, the stress is gonna be equal to the yield strength. So what you're doing here, this section, in order for you to be able to do the plastic distribution, you need to be sure that the section is going to be able to take all of the stresses under F sub Y for the entire depth of the beam, starting from bottom of the concrete all the way to the bottom of the entire beam, which means top of the steel beam to the bottom of the steel beam is going to be exposed to F sub Y. Whatever part is going to be exposed to compression is going to be also equal to F sub Y. And whatever part exposed to tension is going to be each little section of it is going to be exposed to F sub Y. So if you like to do this with your steel beam, you need to be sure it's gonna be compact enough, which means the web is gonna be able to take all of the stresses safely. When you look here at the check in the previous slide, when you look at the check here, how would you make this work? With some given whip thickness or some given beam depth. So let's say if the beam depth is equal to 18 inch. If you play here with the whip thickness and you're gonna be choosing here very small whip thickness, what's gonna happen? This number is going to be big because the depth is going to be the same and this whip thickness is going to be very small, right? So this number here is going to be big and most likely you're going to be in the elastic range. So what you wanted you to do and you are pushing here to do is to have a thicker whip thickness. 
And once the web thickness gets be thicker, it's going to be take, able to take all of this high stresses, if you like, which is equal to F sub y. Are we good? Any questions? Why we have this check for compactness? What is the importance of it? Yes, hello? Back me. Oh, sir, yeah. basically compactness is used to know whether it can be used for elastic stress distribution or plastic stress distribution, right? Yes, so once you do this compactness check, you can decide which one to be able to use. So for example, if the section is not really compact and does not satisfy this condition, just go with this condition, it means you have to use elastic stress. But if the section is compact, you should be able to use any of these two methods. And of course, you'd like to use this method because it can give you bigger strength. What if the section does not com uh, complete both the, um, both the checks, like it fails both checks, then when, when we do with the this section? This check is the same. This is the same check. You see this number is the same as this, just H over TW. If it's gonna be less than or equal, or it's gonna be more. So it's gonna be just one check. Okay. Yeah, so you just do this comparison here. If the section is compact, you're gonna be doing plastic. You're gonna be allowed to do plastic. If the section is non-compact, you cannot do plastic. So plastic or elastic, if you have a compact section, it's gonna be up to you, you can decide. And most likely you'd like to go with the plastic. But when you have it non-compact, you cannot use plastic. You have to do only elastic stress distribution. Okay. If you like to do the elastic stress distribution, we're gonna be using this equation. F is gonna be the stress for bending, is gonna be equal to M times C divided by I. This gives you the common equation that you guys have used before. Nothing here is new. And for the shear, it's gonna be equal to the shear force multiplied by the first moment of area, divided by the moment of inertia, divided by the member thickness. I'm not gonna be using this right now, but this is gonna be the section I'm gonna be working with. This equation. Now let me see how can I use this equation with a steel beam and then it's gonna be a composite beam. And a steel beam is gonna be simple because the entire beam is made out of the steel. So when I do here moment of inertia, I'm gonna be doing the moment of inertia for steel. But now I have a section composed of concrete topping and steel beam. And the question is, which moment of inertia should I use? What should I do about the materials? Because I don't have the same materials. This equation here is good if you have homogeneous materials, which means if you have just one steel beam that you're working with, the problem is gonna happen when you have concrete topping. Let's look here at the strain distribution. Here's the strain distribution. It's gonna be straight line. Whether we have concrete or steel, the strain is going to be this linearly um, relative to the section itself. In the top, you have the concrete with this hatching. In the bottom, you have the steel beam from this point all the way to this point. You have top flange, bottom flange. So what's going to happen? For each strain, you are trying to find out the stress. I'm going to take you back here a couple of slides. I'm gonna say, I start with the strain and based on the strain, I was able to find out the stress. Now how this is done. I can I remind you here with this equation? The model of elasticity is gonna be equal to the stress divided by strain. This is gonna be like the general equation for it. And in this case, the stress is gonna be equal to the strain multiplied by E. E is gonna be the model of elasticity. For the steel, it is equal to 29,000 KSI. This is gonna be a constant value. For the concrete, it's gonna be based on the concrete strength. An average value for concrete is gonna be nearly or roughly equal to 4,000 KSI. Now, how many times are we talking about? Talking about nearly five times. So there's big difference here between ES and EC. In many cases, if you play with the concrete strength, this is gonna be like 3,600. You have a ratio of five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine times. Not just five times. Now let's look what happened here. If you have the strain at any point, 
So we can start here with the strain on the top. You see here's a strain. Do you have here any concrete or do you have a steel? I'm gonna say in the top, I have only concrete. The steel is gonna start right here when you go down. So I'm gonna be taking this. Take the strain here, which is the maximum strain in the concrete, multiply it by E. So you're gonna get to hear the stress in the concrete, which means this value here. Look for any other level. Pick the level at which you'd like to find out the stress. This same gonna be looking here at the maximum stress in the steel down below. You're gonna say here's the amount of strain. How much is the stress here? You're gonna say in this case, I have steel. There is no concrete. So let me take the strain value here, multiply by E for steel. It's gonna get me the stress right here at the bottom. So fine. Let's look here at the point, let's say in the mid height. Let's say at this location. Take the strain, you're gonna say now this is a steel, multiply by E is again the stress in the steel, which means this is stress value. I'm talking about just cutting any arbitrary section right here and say, okay, how much is the strain here? Take the strain, now this can be within the steel, multiply by E for steel, it's gonna give you the stress in the steel, done. Now, it's gonna be very tricky when you go right here at this point, at the interface between the concrete to the steam. Right at this point here, I have one strain value, which is this strain value. Right, right there at the interface. If you go above it by, let's say one eighth of an inch, which is means right next above it. And if you go right below it, what's gonna happen? You go right above it by one eighth of an inch, you're gonna find yourself within concrete. You go down, you're gonna be in the steel, but the strain is almost the same, there's no big change. So I'm gonna say, if you're right there at this point here, let me zoom in. Here's the strain value. If you take it multiplied by ES, it's gave for the steel, it's gave you the stress right here, which means the stress value from here to there. See this value, all of this value. This gave you for the steel. How do you get now this value? By just taking the strain in the beam at this location, multiplied by ES, it's gonna get you here the stress in the steel. But you take the same value here, and then you multiply by E sub C, which means the concrete multiplicity. It's gonna give you the stress here at this value, which means it's gonna be this location here. And this explains that right at this location, you have two stress values. One of them is gave for the steel, which is a big one, and the small ones gave you for the concrete. What happened? I've taken again the same strain, once multiplied by ES, and the other time multiplied by EC. Now, how much is the ratio between 29 to 4? You can say 29 to 4 is gave you maybe seven times. Six and a half, seven times. So the ratio here between ES to EC is gonna be a critical factor for me. And this ratio between ES to EC is going to give me also the ratio between the stress in the steel and the stress in the concrete, which means the stress here in the steel is going to be equal to maybe six to seven times than the stress in the concrete, right next to it, because the strain is going to be the same. So actually this ratio here between ES and EC, we call this the modular ratio, N. And you're going to see it right there. Look at this, ES divided by EC is gonna be equal to N. As you see here, e, EC, which means the strain in the concrete, is gonna be the same as the concrete, uh, as the strain in the steel, right, at this interface. And EC, which means the strain here in the, in, the, in the concrete, the strain in the concrete, is gonna be equal to the stress in the concrete divided by EC, which also is gonna be equal to the stress in the steel divided by ES. I can take this equation and say that stress in the steel is gonna be equal to N divided by, which is ES divided by EC times the stress in the concrete. This is gonna be the same thing I was just saying here, that the stress in the steel is gonna be equal to the stress in the concrete multiplied by N, and what is N? It's gonna be this modular ratio. So if the ratio between ES to EC is gonna be equal to seven times, it means the stress in the steel compared to the stress in the concrete is gonna be equal to five times. It's gonna be that simple. This N again is called the modular ratio. And if you do your analysis and your modular ratio, let's say equal to 7.5, 
you just take it as seven. If it's equal to 8.5, you just take it at eight. If it's 8.8, .8, you just take it as eight, which means that you cut off the fraction and you just use the good number that you have in there. We know that ES is going to be equal to 29,000 for all the steels, but we don't know it for concrete. And for the concrete, we have an equation. And here's the equation. It says E sub C equals to unit weight of the concrete. Let's say that it's going to be 145 or 150 times square root of F prime C. F prime C here is going to be in case psi, according to this equation. This equation is different from the one that we have in the ACI. In the ACI, when it comes to concrete design, the entire, all the equations needs to be in PSI. But AISC, most likely the stress equation is giving KSI, as you see here. Now, I don't have in this section or in this section, I don't have here homogeneous material. So I'd like here to work with an equation. I'd like to use this equation here. So I need to have this moment of inertia. And this moment of inertia, not just for the steel and not just for the concrete. It's going to be for the composite section, for the combined concrete and steel. I'm not able to do it because I don't have one material. So my only chance is to convert one of these materials into the other which means either take the concrete, convert it to new steel, or take the steel, convert it into concrete. So the question is, how do you convert it? How do you transfer it into steel or concrete? The conversion factor here is gonna be this N factor that we're just talking about. So what you need to do is take the concrete, cross-section area, divide by N. And once you do this, you convert the concrete into steel material. And in this case, your equation for the top stress in the beam or in the steel section, because now you convert concrete into steel, is going to be equal to the total moment multiplied by some y distance divided by i, which is this transferred moment of inertia. For the bottom, it's going to be the same, but it's going to be y bottom, and it's going to be called transferred moment of inertia. Now let's see what is this transfer moment to inertia or what's happening there. If you take here the entire cross section area of the concrete deck or slab or flange and divide by n, it means that you're gonna be either taking the width divided by n or the thickness divided by n. If I take here the thickness divided by n, it means that the thickness is gonna be very thin and the moment of inertia is gonna be different. So my only chance, if I take the width here, divide by n. So what I need to do is to find out the n, the modular ratio. This n is going to be based on ES divided by EC. And then take the width of the concrete deck and divide it by n. So let's say n is going to be equal to 7. I'm just throwing here a number. And this width is going to be equal to 70 inches. If you like to convert this concrete deck into steel, you take the 70 divided by 7. The width here in the transfer section is going to be equal to only 10 inches in my analysis. And with that, I'm going to have a section that I may call it now the entire section is going to be steel section. And then after that, I'm going to be able to find out this location of the neutral axis. How do you find it? This is like finding the centroid. How do you find the centroid? You take the moment about the top or about the bottom for each one of the subsections and equate it to the total moment of the entire area. With that, you get this Y bar, and this gives you the CG location. Now, in a case like this, you come here, you say now my beam here, the transferred section, is gonna be made out of steel, not concrete. If this is gonna be the case, the stress at the bottom is gonna be equal to the moment. You divide this by I transferred, multiplied by Y bottom you get here the stress at this location. Now, if you do the same equation here and you use Y top, in this case, the stress is gonna be kind of a little bit higher than expected. Why? Because now you treat the entire section as a steel section. So what you need to do once you come here to 
something that you know originally is going to be concrete and once it comes to the stress you need to divide here by n so why you need to divide by n to bring it back to the actual stress in the concrete but when it comes to moment of inertia you're going to use the moment of inertia as if the entire section is made out of steam anyone follow me <laughs> Yes, Professor. All right, thanks, Mike. Hey, Bakri. Mr. Bakri. You have any questions? Hey, Bakri. All right, I called Bakri a few times. He's not in with us. I don't know what he's doing. Um, Basil, are you there? Yes, Professor. Okay, Basil. Tell me, Basil, what is this N about? What is this ratio of? If you can um, help me, please, with this. Um, relating the two modules of elasticity between steel and concrete. And why do I need to, to find do that? the ratio? Yeah, why do I need it? Um, Okay, let me rephrase my question. What is this ITR, this transfer? Um, when we change the section from, because we have two different materials, concrete and steel. Yes. When we change, trying to change that um, concrete slab to the steel slab. The, yes, the why, actual, why would you do this? Um, what was the purpose of doing Just that? because, because of the modulus of elasticity, right? Yeah, but why do you need because to do this? What is the benefit of doing it? The modulus of elasticity would be higher for a composite structure, for a composite section. So if you calculate it and use it in your equation, it'll come out with lower stresses. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm gonna say this is partial, um, um, answer here, but I want to also emphasize that that you guys you understand that I cannot use this equation, which is the stress is going to be equal to m divided by i times y, unless I have a homogeneous section. I cannot use it when one one part of the equation here or one part of the of the section is going to be concrete, the other part is going to be steel. You cannot use this equation because the question is going to be which moment of inertia do you want to use? Which material are you going to be working with? Because moment of inertia, if you take this B divided by N, is going to be completely different. So you need to make the material to be homogeneous. And I want you to read this. What is ITR? Moment of inertia about the neutral axis. And then it says, same as centroidal axis for this homogeneous section. You need to have a homogeneous section before you start to look at this equation. So I need to have here transformed equation or transformed moment of inertia to consider the entire section is going to be made either out of steel or concrete. Which means if someone's going to come here and say, no, no, I'd like here to multiply everything in the steel by, or, or divide everything in the steel by N to make the whole thing out of concrete, I'm going to say, yes, you can do this, but it is not recommended. It is just easier because all the codes and all the equations, they are built on the fact that you'd like to reduce the concrete and make it as of concrete, as of steel, excuse me. So what, what you do here, you take the concrete divided by N, you're going to make it smaller, because the steel is going to be stronger. And based on this, you find out the transfer moment of inertia. And then after that, you can use your equation. So I'm going to keep going here through one example to make it a little bit uh, clear to us. It says here that you have a composite beam. And it's going to be W16 by 36. Usually 16 is going to be the depth. 36 is going to be the weight. ASTM number 992 means that the grade is going to be 50 KSI. It's not going to help much in this case, but just giving piece of information about the material. It has five inch thick by 87 inch wide. So the total width of the actual concrete slab is 87. And the thickness is going to be five inches above the W16 by 36 that has a depth of 15.9 inches to be exact. The strength of the concrete is 4 KSI. It says here, determine the maximum stress in the steel and concrete resulting from a positive moment, which means tension is going to be bottom, 
compression is given the top and the bending moment is equal to 160 kip foot. Now I need to find out the stress on the top and bottom. Let me take you back here a few slides, which means I'd like to use these two equations. If I want to use them, I need to find out this transform moment of inertia. The moment itself is given. It says you're 160 kip foot. Y top and Y bottom, I should be able to figure it out. So I need to solve for this Y top, Y bottom and transform moment of inertia. I said, okay. The amount of elasticity for the concrete is gonna be given by this equation. And you'll note that in here, only in this equation, this is gonna be taken from the AIC, not the ACI. That four is used here as four and not 4,000. So be careful about units. Unit weight is going to be 145. Look at E sub C, 34.92 KSI. For the steel, it's 29. Look at the N value. N is going to be equal to ES divided by EC. And as you see here, I have it at 8.3. Just use it as 8. If this number here is 8.7, use 8. You still use it as 8. You don't use it to 9. You don't round it up. Usually, you just cut this fraction and use this number here, the 8. Now what happened to the width? The width used to be 87 inches. You divide this by eight, it's gonna be now 10.88 inches. And this explains that this in transform section, you're gonna see here 10.88 and not really 87 inches. Any questions? No. All right, we're good. Now I need to find out the center here, the center of the section. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna build a quick table. This is gonna be for the concrete, of course, transform it into steel because it shows here the area is gonna be 54.4. This 54.4, how would you get this? You're gonna say, take the 1088 times five. It's gonna give you this concrete section. Y is gonna be the distance from the top line here. So two and a half is gonna be, this is gonna be to the center of the concrete. It's gonna be one half of the five inches. The cross-section area for the steel, W section is gonna be 10.6. You look it up from the steel table. The distance is 1295. How would you get this distance? You're gonna go back here. Maybe right here is good. You're gonna say it's gonna be equal to five inch plus 15.9 divided by two because the center is gonna be right here, 1295. Now take the moment about the top line. It's gonna be A times Y, A times Y, add them all up together. The total moment for each one of this subsection is gave you 273. Total area is 65 square inches. This Y bar location of the centroid, you take summation of all of this moments divided by this area, it's gonna give you here 4.2 inches. Now here's the trick. This line here is shown where? At five inches. So I was expecting that this Y bar, according to this drawing, is gonna be right here at the bottom. It turned to be right here. So actually, the location of this centroid is gonna be right here. It's gonna be within the concrete deck itself, which means it's gonna be right here. This is gonna be the neutral axis location, right? So, okay. Now let me figure out the tra this transform moment of inertia. I say, okay. Let me take here the area for each one of this section. Again, Y bar or this just Y, same thing that they have in this table. And then here's the moment of inertia for each section about its own centroid. So I'm gonna say here, 10.88, the width times five cubed divided by 12. And this moment of inertia for the steel beam, I'm gonna be looking, up, looking it up from the steel tables. This D distance is gonna be the distance from the centroid main centroid for the entire composite section to the centroid of each subsection. I'm gonna let you guys, you can work on this. After this, I'm gonna be doing the total moment of inertia for this composite section and turn to be here 1530. So this section here, you guys, you have learned in statics, I guess, and also mechanics of materials, how to find out the moment of inertia for one combined section. I'm not gonna say here composite, because when I say combine, it means that you have two shapes and you're trying to find out homogeneous shapes and you're trying to find out the moment of inertia for them. 
all right? So total mode of inertia is gonna be 15, 30 inch to the fourth. So great, good, now I have this number. Now I need to figure out this Y top. Now Y top is not gonna be this one. Y top is gonna be from here to there. It says here is gonna be equal to 4.2 minus five inches. Why 4.2 minus five inches? Now here's the neutral axis. Neutral axis is gonna be at 4.2. You subtract five inches, it's gonna be the distance from the neutral axis to the top of the steam. It's gonna be negative 0.79895. Y bottom is gonna be equal to T plus the depth minus D. It's gonna be the thickness of the slab, it's gonna be five inch plus 15.9. It's gonna be total thickness. You subtract here 4.2, you subtract this piece. Okay. It's gonna be the distance from the neutral axis all the way to the bottom of the steel beam, 16.7. Now I'm trying to find out the stresses in three locations. The stress on the top of the concrete, the stress at the interface between the steel to concrete, and the stress at the bottom of the steel beam. I have this distance from the neutral axis all the way to the bottom. This is the one that says here 16.7. Can I go back here one step? Here's 16.7 from the neutral axis all the way to the bottom. I'm gonna start with the one at the bottom. I'm gonna say the stress equals moment divided by moment of inertia times y bottom. 160 is gonna be the moment, give foot, multiply this by 12, put it in keep inches. This is for unit conversion. And then you multiply by 16.7 distance from the neutral axis all the way to the bottom of the steel beam. And then you divide here by the moment of inertia transferred moment of inertia. And with that, I have 21 KSI as a tension stress at this location. Any questions? Any questions? We're good? We're good, Professor. All right. Um, should we continue or should we say, oh, this is enough, 645? All right. Can I finish this more? question? Mm -hmm. What's that? Do you want to finish this question? Yes, sir. Okay. I finished in one minute. <laughs> so that if you want to leave, you can leave. How about the stress here? I'm going to say the stress here. Neutral axis and the distance is going to be equal to 795 inch. If you remember, this is going to be the point 0.795 inch from here to there. Do the same equation. But lie by 0.795. We're going to have almost one KSI in the steel. This still is going to be in the steel. This is not in the concrete. Now look at the top of the concrete. What should I do now? I'm going to say, yes, I have the same equation, same moment. Distance from the neutral axis, top of concrete is going to be 4.2. Divide by moment of inertia. But to bring it down to the concrete stress, I'm going to divide here by N, which is 8. And with that, I have 0.66 KSI. All right, for now, if you have any questions, you may stay with us. Uh, if you like to leave, go ahead and sign out. Just type your name and leave, please. I will continue in one minute from now, after we sign out and you leave. I'm just gonna be here to answer questions. I'm not gonna continue or move forward. This is gonna be our last slide for today. Um, sir, I came late to the class today, so is my attendance marked? Say it again, please. What did you say? I came late to the class, so is my attendance marked or not? Oh, you mean for today? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, when did you come, Nahin? Where I, at? What slide did you start at? No, I came before the slides, uh, before you started the slides. You came before I started the slides? Yes, but after you finished uh, taking attendance. 